Welcome to another pint with Shawnee B coming to you from southwest London today on a sunny, rainy, drizzly spring day. Uh, I've got an amazing guest, one of the world's great poets, a man whose son has been on a pint with Shawnee B many, many moons ago. Also a world-class artist, Simon Harsand, a photographer, a good friend of mine. I'm here with his father, David Harsand. Welcome, sir. Good welcome. I mean, hello. David is Professor of Creative Writing at Roehampton University. He's a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, an Honorary Research Fellow at Royal Holloway, and he's a prolific writer with, I think, something close, over 30 publications to his name. He's written uh, crime and fiction under pseudonyms Jack Curtis and David Lawrence. Uh, we're going to interrupt the podcast today with some readings from his latest collection, which is called Salt, which was published a couple of years ago. And um, apart from that, I want to hear all about his life. You were born in Devon just during the war. 1942, the yeah. darkest year of the war. The concentration camps were full. The ovens were working overtime. Pretty appalling year to be born in. Although um, my father was uh, shooting and getting shot at by various people in the Western Desert. And according to my mother, we were on two occasions, strafed, although we were in Devonshire. Well, of course, the ports were getting a pace, you know. Occasionally, fighters that accompanied the bombers would, for fun, shoot up a a village or a town or something, presumably because they hadn't had anything else to shoot up if the the bombing raid went in an untroubled, more or less untroubled kind of way. And uh, the cottage hospital in which I was born was attacked, and nurses came running into the room where all the women were uh, with their children in bed and screamed, get under your beds. And there was a lot of shooting and breaking of glass and so on. Um, I was day old, I think. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Are are you memories though? Because you were five, six when the rebuild was happening. What was that that like? Well, I don't remember my father coming home, oddly. I was talking to my aunt, my mother's half-sister, who was the only person now left alive and she said everyone she knows from that era who was a child remembers their father coming yeah. home from the war. I just don't remember him coming home at all. But then we'd never met. Um, he came from a pretty poor family. I think he, he joined the army to get a square meal, I think. Really? <laughs> but I don't remember merely much of that. I remember rationing. I remember my mother going to um, buy material from the drapers and the draper cutting coupons from her ration book really? with a pair of very very long very heavy looking yeah, drapery things. scissors yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean you know i come from a working class family although the other side of the family my mother's side of the family were were middle class my father's lot were sort of horny handed sons of toil from devonshire <laughs> and um, horny handed uh, sons of toil <laughs> <laughs> And we lived in in pretty awful circumstances, but I didn't, that is to say, uh, my grandmother had an apartment, a flat, a very small flat in mid Buckinghamshire, a place called Princess Risborough. She was twice widowed, needed a job badly. She got this job as the night and Sunday telephonist of the telephone exchange and a flat went with it. So it was, it was a tied flat. Yeah. Yeah. And it only had three bedrooms and we were all there until I was nine years old, and then we got a social housing council house on an estate. I grew up on a social housing estate. Somebody once said to me in an interview, uh, there must have been advantages to growing up working class, thinking sort of gritty experience and all that kind of thing, you know. Check your privilege. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> shove your privilege. And I said, well, the only advantage I can think of is that I learned how to take a punch in the face and keep going forward. Very good. So yeah. all I learned. <laughs> Were you an only child or did you have brothers and sisters? No, I've got a sister who's um, eight years younger than me. Right. She was born up when my father got home from the war. Was your, was your father affected by the war in terms oh, of yes. PTSD? Yes, he yeah, was. Which yeah. wouldn't have been a thing. He then. was quite badly wounded and had he been an officer, he would have been sent home. But they stuck him in a field hospital, patched him up and put him back in the line. Really? He was a sergeant in charge of a 13-pounder field gun and he didn't talk much about the war at all. His brother... My uncle Boxer, who was his name was Samuel, but he was called Boxer for fairly obvious yeah, reasons. Yeah. He, he wasn't a boxer, but he liked to yeah. fight. <laughs> um, would he would talk about the war, and he would talk about my father's role in the war, but my father never did. 
You now and again, he would tell me, we had an awkward relationship, it mm. should be said, my father and I. It was partly my fault. I mean, I, I just didn't understand what he'd been through. Yeah. And he'd been badly traumatized by the war, it's yeah. perfectly evident. Uh, I just, I, it's really weird, you know, from thinking about the troubles when I grew up in Northern Ireland to the war to, like, even from this juncture, it just seems insane. Like, the, the men killing men and... and, 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 and I just, it feels like it should be a hundred years ago rather than fifty. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. What was it? What was that transition like for the end of the war and you getting into school and like were you? Did you enjoy your school days? Or no, what? no, absolutely. Hated I saw you, you said you were taught by bullying ignoramuses. That yeah, was well, <laughs> when I the, yes, I went to a, a local primary school. That was sort of okay-ish, although the headmistress, uh, who others have said was a perfectly nice woman, I think hated me for reasons that. I can't fathom because I was only a kid. And I remember going once to an open day with my grandmother because my mother worked in the evenings and yeah. so she could never go with me or didn't want to possibly. <laughs> and um, I remember her saying, um, I'm David Harson's grandma and I, you know, how's he getting on sort of thing. And this, this woman said, David will never amount to anything. Wow. And there are times when you sort of wish people were still alive. Yeah. And you could say, well, um, perhaps you'd just like to watch while Professor Harson takes a bow on the stage at the Royal Opera House, <laughs> you bitch. You know, so. <laughs> um, but anyway, that wasn't too bad. Uh, but just was, sticking on that point, there is a thing in, in my view, and a lot of the people that I've had on the show have rebelled very young or questioned question religion, question religious teaching. Oh, yes. I've been a pain in the hole for teachers, right? Yeah. But where, if you think about the education system, it is about driving conformity and looking for the plastic bit where you break them off the mold. And any kid who yeah. steps outside that is a problem. That's a very good image, the plastic bit where you yeah. break them off the mold. It's an extremely good image. Yeah. Well... So you probably had yeah, that. Yeah, it, it was that, yes. It, 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 and I was very conscious of the fact that there were kids at this school whose parents were really quite well-to-do because it was a local school and the, school, and the, and the village was very mixed in terms of... Yeah. There were council estates, but there were also big houses. It wasn't too bad that time at primary school. I was, I was good at something. I was, I was the fastest runner in the school. I was never beaten in a foot race until I ran at the White City for the school when I was about 11 or 12 yeah. or something. This kid showed me a clean pair of heels. I was very upset. Um, and I was good at English. And I was read to by my aunt in particular. And my great-grandmother used to read to me. Yeah. The library was, was a standby to us. I mean, I'm an autodidact. I didn't go to university neither, um, no. for reasons that uh, have to do with this grotesque education that I suffered. What came between being at the primary school and going to the school where the bullies and the thugs were, uh, the teachers, that is to say, not the, not the kids, I, had, I fell down a stairwell, which changed my life. And what happened, I, I just pitched over the, I, I was trying to slide down the banisters right. on, okay. my, on, my, <laughs> on my stomach like this, you know. Right. And I just went over. And the only person who was there at the time was my aunt. She said, I saw you going. And I reached out to grab for you, but you'd gone. And she had nightmares about it for years. But what I said to her at the time was, oh, I was probably okay. You reached out and gave me a shove without knowing it. That's what took me over. You know? so you anyway, face planted at the bottom of the stairs, did you? I went 25 feet down the stairwell onto Ooh. a concrete floor. Ooh. And I remember turning in the air. I can remember it now. I can remember what I saw when I turned in the air. I saw the underside of the landing that yeah. I'd fallen from and it had a crack running across it. And I remember thinking, that's dangerous. I must tell grandma about that. The slow motion of car accidents. Yeah, the all that. Then I hit the deck. But I didn't break any bones. I was concussed. Yeah. And I didn't have any internal injuries. It's quite extraordinary. And uh, my aunt ran into the telephone exchange where it was a Sunday. I was on my way to Sunday school. Think of the irony in that. I told my grandmother this had happened. She immediately phoned the doctor who sent for an ambulance. But the doctor apparently said, she said, David Harson's fallen from the top landing at the post office. And he knew the layout pretty well because he came to see my great grandmother every week and he came to see my father every week because his war wounds were still troubling him. And he said, is he dead? Yeah. I mean, he, um, the pliability of youth. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, I'd say if he did it now, you'd be dead. Oh, Christ, yes. <laughs> I read a book called A Bird's Idea of Flight, um, of which, of course, there is no such thing. There's instinct, though, and that interests me. And I said to my elder daughter, you know, darling, 
when the time comes, when the doctor says, you know, your marbles are disappearing fast or it's terminal or whatever, you know, there's a little group of women, some of whom you know, some of whom you might not, who have agreed to come with me to a nice place called Blackhead down in Cornwall, which is a very steep and precipitous cliff with a couple of bottles of whiskey. And I, the idea is that I would neck the whiskey and you nudge me over. Yeah. And she said, can't wait, she says. <laughs> we have, so, I, we went to, my girlfriend is here as well. We have the same thing we're planning for... Uh, Maybe uh, Switzerland or somewhere. I, I mean, but I want to fly. You see, that's why the. Oh yes, yeah, so I go back to the, the going bridge, down. Yeah, the, yeah. I want to. I want to fly. You'll and also I, see things on the way down. It'll, it'll be a memory of the fall in, in, in yeah. the school. There'll be a crack on the cliff. On the cliff there was tell God that's very yeah. dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell the lifeguard. <laughs> oh wait a minute! No, I um, that's a, a violent end, though. The well, split, the impact yeah, and yeah, it would be a violent end. They'd be quite drunk. Yeah. You would be pissed, yeah, yeah, that's true. In fact, you'd probably black out on the way down, wouldn't you? Don't you think? Maybe. No, maybe not. I don't know. You I, I don't edge, particularly you want to. hit you with a spade instead of a knife. No, I want, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know my elder daughter. <laughs> she probably has a reserve you definitely spade. definitely black out. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say. No, she's a lovely woman. She's also a very gifted potter. Right. Um, and has made me a wonderful moon jar, which I, it's up in my study, and which I can't take my eyes off. Um... So, yeah, so I had this fall. So I, I was laid up for a bit in bed. I, I came out of hospital after a couple of days, but I was laid up in bed for a bit. My grandmother went to the library to get me some books to read. And she came back with a, a number of books, one of which was a bumper book for boys. Tales of Arctic exploration, Dare yeah, do, yeah, and yeah. supposed role models. I yeah. mean, people like, you know, Baden-Powell and other, yes, other yes, such grotesques, yes. you know. Yes. Kind of. <laughs> but between each of these stories, between each of these tales was a poem. And all the poems were of the same sort. And I didn't know what they were. What I did know was that I was deeply drawn to them. I just read the poems over and over again. And then I said to my grandmother, could you go to the library and see if there's a book full of poems like this? You know. So she went, she asked the librarian, who obviously knew her stuff, and she came back with Quilla Cooch's Oxford Book of Ballads, and they were border ballads. And at that moment, I was just sold. I never wanted to do anything but write lines of poetry. And I still don't ever want to do anything but write lines of poetry in the odd bit of lyric prose, perhaps. But because of what that... What age were you? 11. Wow. Because of which I didn't take the 11 plus examination. So I didn't go to grammar school at that point. I went to secondary modern school and then took a, a, a catch-up exam called the 13 plus, which I did pass. And I went to Aylesbury Technical School. And it was a choice between that and Wickham Grammar School. And it's perfectly obvious that Wickham Grammar School would have been the better school for me. Right. But I always assumed that my marks weren't good enough to get me to Wickham College. It turns out that that wasn't the case. It turns yeah. out from consultation with my aunt that my father had decided I should go to Aylesbury Tech because he was a bricklayer, my dad. He thought, and I don't blame him for it. I really don't. Because the track of my life has been what it's been and I'm happy with yeah. that. Well, I wouldn't say I was happy with it. I'm, I'm comfortable with it. He just thought I'd learn a trade. And indeed, although I left there, you, you couldn't go to university from that school. It was impossible. That's why I didn't go. But in addition to leaving with an O-level in English and an O-level in English literature, I also had an ordinary national certificate in metalwork and woodwork technology, which mysteriously I haven't been able to call on <laughs> in, my, like in my pursuit of employment. <laughs> But like that, so had you been writing poetry from 11 till, I guess, what, you're now 16? Had you been writing a lot of poetry? Yeah. So was there any sense of your old man, because uh, back in the day, poetry writing would be seen as a kind of a, a feat yeah. kind of oh, pastime. Yeah. Was he trying to kind of get you into, I don't know, tough, toughen you up or, or, or something like that? Or? Yeah, well, um, the only good thing was that I could run. I went to a county sports. He did come and watch me, actually. He didn't often come, but, I mean, I sound as if I'm, hated him but the point is i mean he got up early in the morning he rode his bike to get to the building site in the winter i mean they'd chip the ice off the bricks before they started work and you know it wasn't fun yeah. so but he and i i went to this county sports and i i won four events and set two county records so i mean there was that kind of aspect of, yeah, yeah 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 i suppose he never said he won were you into your football and all that was that a thing? um he used to criticize well even say used to i remember on one occasion he criticized me 
when I was playing on the on the right wing for holding my arms out like a bird or an aeroplane or something. Yeah. I thought that was an affectation. And I don't think I was all that good at football. Mm -hmm. I like football, but I wasn't all that good at it. Did you go with your dad to games or stuff like that? He took me once to Wickham Wanderers. Wickham yeah. Wanderers. yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Did you feel isolated as a kid? A oh, enormously. And independent as a result? Hmm. Or scared? Yeah. I was scared some of the time. I was scared of him. I was scared. No, I wasn't scared. I mean, I made friends quite easily. I was a con man when it came to friendships. You know, I mean, What's I could mean? talk people into being my friend. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> um, I had this little band of followers. I don't think I've ever told anyone this story. <laughs> I had this little band of followers at school. My uncle was a soldier, a regular soldier, and he was he was over all the, all over the world, imposing British rule on all sorts of unwilling people. Yeah. And also he was doing as he was told, of course, but yeah. um, we talk about men killing men. I mean, they, they do it because they're told to. Yeah. And if they don't, the, other, the man that's been told to kill them will kill them. Yeah. So in any I mean, event... What you just said there, it's, actually, it's such a... What? <laughs> well, I think they, someone, I read somewhere someone said that the worst kind is that kind of... When a society... Like, usually they talk about about Nazism and the people who were, you know, employed to put the Jews on the, on the trains would do that. Yes. And the soldiers would be watching them ah, do yes. that. And just this, and how quickly can get to that. Humanity walks, walks out the door. Yes. And people turn into automatons and, and, and fearful automatons, yes. you know. And, yes. And it Absolutely. can happen very quickly. Yeah. I mean, that's a little bit of it there. Well, I've got a, a very close friend, a woman who's a poet, and she's a Jew. And we talk about this sometimes. There was a TV program about a, a guy, uh, a Jewish guy from Leeds, who decided he wanted to track his uh, family, and he got back to the, to the show. And he, he went to the shtetl, and he was talking to very old people, women, of course, they live longer than men, talking to an old woman uh, about the time the soldiers turned up, herded about a thousand Jews to the local park, made them all lie down, shot them all. And I remember saying to my friend, where did they find those men who would do that? Because yeah. it wasn't the SS. It wasn't some crazed, psychopathic ideologue. They were just people who previously had been living normal lives. Mm -hmm. What occurred to me when I, I made some versions of uh, Goran Simic's... I was just uh, going to mention both. Yeah. Because I've done a lot of work at Sarajevo. Oh, right. I've got, okay. got, got a godson out there. So I Have know you an know? awful lot about that. And I've done a lot of interviews with with some of the war artists and people who've done I mean, it's shocking. You know, yes. shocking but yeah. Uh, yeah, I saw that you'd done Goran. Goran. Well, I mean, I, there was a guy called Mario Sushko who was a poet and who taught at the university and so forth. And he was staying with us. Uh, he was up at um, UEA doing a research on, on Seamus Heaney um, when all this was happening, when the barricades were beginning to go up. And he came back from there and he stayed overnight with us. I put him on the plane the next morning. And I said, look, I hope you'll be okay. And he said, well, unless some Serb border guard wants to have fun at my, was crow, yeah. wants to have fun at my expense. expense. Well, then I didn't see Mario until about two years, two and a half years, three years into the siege. Yeah. And he managed to get out because his, his younger daughter had been born in the States. Yeah. And he did manage to get out. And Julia, my wife and I met Mario and his wife at Liverpool Street Station, towing these kind of five suitcases or whatever they had. It was all they owned yeah. in the world. And they stayed with us for a bit, and then they went to the States, just a couple of nights. And I remember saying to him, how did this happen? And he said, people you had known for years suddenly were living either actually or metaphorically on the other side of the street. Um, so there are more Serbs on that side of the street, I should be on that side. And sometimes it was a metaphor, and sometimes people actually moved. Yeah. Uh, they were uncomfortable in that area. They Not quite the other side of the street, but that area of the town. And I guess... That was how it happened. But people Severin, did was, unspeakably yeah, barbaric things. Yeah. I remember just looking at the newspaper, looking at pictures of concentration camps springing up again in Middle Europe. Yeah, yeah. There they were. Yeah. And I, the reason I knew these people was that I went to um, Struga, it was, to, to a poetry reading. And I then got invited back to the Sarajevo Poetry Days. And I did that. And then I, I led a little contingent of poets from this country mm there they featured British poetry um, and I was the sort of team leader whatever and then I went back a couple of times because I made a lot of friends to read at the Writers Union and I gave a reading at the Writers Union and this 
guy called Peter Loney, whom I knew pretty well, who was an expat, he lived there. And the people came up to me after the reading and said, that was nice, or I enjoyed that, or talked to me about this, that, or the other. And one guy came up and said, yeah, I liked your reading very much. I, too, am a poet. And I said, oh, are you? That's interesting. And we chatted for a bit and so on. And about a short while after, after the war started, this was obviously before the war, Peter got out, his marriage broke up, and he got out. And uh, he and I were having lunch in London, and he was talking, because this was Peter, he was talking about people who would benefit from a bullet in the brain, one of whom was Radovan Karadzic. Yeah. And uh, I said... Not unfair. Thought, Not unfair. And he said, well, you met Karadzic. He came to your reading. And I wow. said, Jesus Christ, that guy that came up to me and said, I wow. like, and I too am a poet. Because, of course, he wrote these long... And Hitler was an tiles. artist. Yes, <laughs> yes. Hitler, there was a painter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, he wrote these long sort of whining poems about the field of blackbirds and you yeah. know all that Turkish invasion and so on and so forth and yeah and I thought well I could have shot the son of a bitch then and saved everyone the trouble yeah. when you did, a, you, you did it's, not, it's not translating how do, how do you <clears throat> yeah because I don't you, speak Bosnian well indeed how do you take Goran's I think it was called the graveyard sprinting from the sprinting graveyard sprinting from the graveyard yeah. how do you do that do you, do, do you just get someone to read it in English how, how does it all work that you bring out a ver- an English version of his poems how does that all work well in general I did it with Yanis Ritsos too wonderful Greek poet who again w- was a victim in lots of ways he, he was three times oppressed first by the Metaxas regime that burned his books in front of the Parthenon then during the Greek Civil War because he was a communist and then latterly with the, the Colonel's Junta and he yeah. was sent to camps and uh, he never stopped writing. Extraordinary man. When he was in the camps he wrote poems. You were not, Of course it was forbidden. I mean you'd be pretty savagely treated if you were caught writing a poem. And he wrote these poems and, and hid them in the empty cans of this sort of foul dog food they were given to eat. Disgusting. But, and buried them around the perimeter of the camp in the hope that they might be found later. Some of which he memorised. But and I don't speak Greek. Um, the way of, there are two ways of translating poetry in general. There are two ways of translating poetry. One is to speak the language very well. Generally speaking, that results in a fairly accurate description, as accurate as possible. Clunky, Not necessarily, but true to the original is the idea. The notion of, of um, you know, literal translations is out of the window because it's just going to be a word for word thing. So somebody who speaks the language very well, but whose first language is English, let's say you're translating into English, will generally speaking do as true a job as they can to what the yeah. poet. The other method is to say it's impossible to render this poem uh, into English by being completely true to what the poet said. What you must do is find the heart of this poem and cause it to beat in another body, as it were. One of your quotes I liked was, if I don't hear the music, I don't see the poem. And I think if, you, if you're writing poetry in Bosnian or whatever language, the tick-tock and the, and, the, and the kind of, you know, I hear you when you read your own poems, which you'll do in a minute now, but there's this, uh, you know, there's a tick-tock. You know, there's, a kind mm. of a, there's a kind mm. of a metronomic way. Whereas if you start trying to literally... I'm sure translate that into that English, the TikTok of the Bosnian can get lost, right? Mm. So you have mm. to. Are you saying that the second way is almost like uh, capturing? I suppose it's like doing a cover version of music, is it? Yeah. It's as being true to the poem as you can while finding a new version of it in English. I think is is the best way of, of putting it. There are people who would say that traducing the original poem, and I accept that if that's what they want to think, uh, that's how they regard translation then they are people who will always look for a translation that's as close to what the poet actually yeah. said as possible versions as opposed to translations versions trade off the original uh, poem without in any way traducing or betraying it it seems to me uh, in order to get a poem close to the original that will speak directly to an english reader as if it had been written by an English poet. Were there any of the poems from, from the Bosnian collection, for example, that you just said, I have no idea where to begin translating? No, what no. happened, that's the general. Um, there, there, there's a specific circumstance with Goran's work. Uh, there's a guy called Bill Tribe, uh, now no longer with us, sadly, who, who uh, taught at the university in, in Sarajevo. 
And he went back to do the two camera work for a Channel 4 series called Bloody Bosnia and also to try and get his wife out, uh, who was Bosnian and was living in Dobrinja, which is, I'm sure you know, where a lot of the hand-to-hand fighting took place, those flats that were built for the Winter Olympics, (laughs) which everyone wanted and then suddenly became the most dangerous place to be. And Bill knew Goran Simic and his wife Amala, who was my translator. That's how I knew them particularly. Although my was local... as well. Oh, right. 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 Okay. <laughs> and he visited them on this occasion and, and Amala gave Bill the poems that Goran had written under siege, translated by her, literally, ah. like word for word. Right. So what I had was, was the perfect template for my versions. What I had was exactly what the poet had yes. said, regardless of rhythm, regardless of phrasing, yeah. regardless of prosody, and so on. Uh, she's a good translator, so I'm not saying that they were some literal or anything, yeah. quite the reverse. I mean, she actually was the person who translated Waiting for Godo into Bosnian when Susan Sontag produced that play during the siege. So that, that's what I had. That was the raw material that I had. So the images that Goran was using, uh, the inflections and so on and so forth, were all his. The fr- the putting together, the making of a poem, the music, as it were, yeah. uh, and so on and so forth. And, and I also, I, I felt free to change, as I felt free with the Ritzos versions, to change things, add things, take things away, in order to get what seemed to me the perfect shape for this poem. Has anyone ever done your poetry in a different language? Yeah, yeah. How, German, does, that, how does that... Well, I, I'm a mono... Well, you don't know the language, mate. <laughs> because, of my, because of my grotesque education, <laughs> I'm a monolinguist, which is bloody shameful. Yeah. I mean, I should at some point have... have there are made Greek or something. A bit of French would help. Yeah. <laughs> let's um, go with one of your poems. Let's, let's do okay. an interval here. So pick something. So I think is this, this is your book, Salt, from 2017. Salt, yes. The okay. thing about Salt is that the poems are extremely short. I think I've said here... I'll just read you this little tiny bit that I said. So the, the poems in this book belong to each other in mood, in tone, and by way of certain images and words that form a ricochet of echoes, not least the word salt. They're a series, not a sequence. Although my intention was that the poems be read as wholly independent of one another, it became apparent as I wrote that some loose disjointed narratives were developing, small broken chains of hint and harmony. Um, so I'll just read this tiny, they're all pretty tiny. Well, the longest one is a sonnet. This is just four lines long. Um, Helix Pamasha, of course, are the edible snails. Okay. But, uh, yeah. You wring them with salt or ash to stop them getting out. So they clean, they void their unpleasantness and you can then have them for right. supper. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Helix Pamasha inside a circle of salt. We endow that purification just as we scatter salt over slugs to have them writhe in cleanliness, just as we lavish salt on a flogged man's back. Mm. Singapore style, the Rattan King. Mm. So I'll be reading that in Cork at the weekend. Nice. <laughs> Let's do another one while we're here. Okay. Rough sleepers turn away and fold into their stench. Scholars of the omphalos and asshole. Go by, go by. Soon they will rise as one, a long silhouette snaking between tail lights and start the final journey to Axis Mundi. The pavement artist have your likeness, that coal black broadcloth suit, that whiskey stagger. Okay, can you dissect that a bit for me? It's homeless people and people on the street. Well, a... not this actual poem, but the... the um... I, I didn't realise that there are... Characters started to develop in the... Yeah. Yes, but it, it's sort of got a, a life of its own after a while. So, so there, there is some observational stuff in here, and yeah. I suppose that's one of the poems that uh, struck me as being observational. It's also to, to an extent about um, interpersonal 
not my interpersonal. I mean, I don't. I write fictions. People sometimes think my poetry is autobiographical, which would be pretty scary to me <laughs> if that were the case. But I do sometimes, as my wife sometimes reminds me, torture people in my poems, mm. people I've invented. So I sometimes come down after a day's work and say, I've been doing terrible things to my little people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, shall I read one of those? Why yeah. not? They salted the streets and posted red weather alerts. He turned her out of bed, and there it was, the little fiction he'd planned for. Her reflection held four square in the bedroom window, driven snow under the coming dawn. Do you like not explaining your work? Sorry, that's a very, very badly answer. Well, phrased question. no. Do you know it, what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's almost impossible to... It's like, where'd you get your ideas from? It's the yeah, same no, kind of, you know, so stupid, Tom yeah. Stoppard once immortally said, if I knew I'd go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the opening of Ash Wednesday, Lady Three White Leopards Sat on Juniper. Somebody said to Elliot, you know, what did you mean when you wrote Lady Three White Leopards Sat on He said, well, what I meant was Lady Three White Leopards Sat <laughs> So if, if, you, if you reduce the poem to a prose sense, you think, well, A, this appears to be a key to unlock the poem, and it's not, of course. Mm. Um, and it's not even where the poem began, because the reason I mentioned that where do you get your ideas from thing is because, and you, you will know this, you will know this as well as I, that pieces of writing don't come from ideas. They come from a little nudge. They come from a little emotional heft. They come, right. they come from a little buzz. Yes. And, and then something grows from that. And with me, it always tends to be words coalescing around music or rhythm or something of yeah. that kind. And I don't know where... If somebody said, what was the beginning of this poem? And I would say, well, these words came into my head, but I heard the music before I got the words. Right. Reminds me of at university, I taught a very brief course on lyrics for songs, because I've written a few mm. of television shows I wrote, mm. you know, when I was making a living writing for telly. And you worked on the Bill and Holby series. I did, like yeah, that. Midsummer Murders, yeah. yeah, wonderful show. We we call it Midsummer Mortgage in this house. Okay. <laughs> um, You're quoted somewhere as saying I said something to the effect that I used to think Dylan Thomas was a good poet, mm, right? Mm. And I, I, before we switch this on, I mean, I wrote write a bit of poetry, and I, 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 I feel such a sham because I don't feel myself as a poet. But there are, to me, there are two types of poetry. There are inaccessible, hard to wrangle pieces of poetry. And then there's the Robert Frost, Dylan mm. Thomas, which are very lyrical, mm. but, 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 but I can understand what's going on. Yeah. I find myself gravitating towards the latter. Well, you see, that's what you think, but you're wrong. Okay. Good. <laughs> because oh, yeah. if you can tell me what the altar wise to owl light sequence means... You know, my wife comes from a Welsh family yeah. and her dad was a great Dylan Thomas fan. And I used to say, I didn't say I thought Dylan Thomas, I, I just, I can't, I can't feed off Dylan Thomas. I can't yes. get anything. Yeah. Do you find uh, it just one dimensional? Uh, it's full of a flat, it's, I mean, it, yeah. it's full yeah. of wind. I do jokes about it. Like, yeah. Right. And overhead the plane does run. Yes. <laughs> you yes. just keep rambling on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, that's as we sit Thomas here reading, with our isn't it? podcast yeah. on, and people at the door don't speak of rumbling <laughs> and bubble and squeak. And, yeah, I, I, yeah, and he would say, you know, you're quite wrong about Dylan Thomas. Of course, a genius poet, and so on. And he was a great enophile. And I said, I said to him on occasion, Don, I will give you a case of Chateau Lafitte if you can tell me what the altar wise in that Alight sequence means. Yeah. So it's not sure. I but think is he Dylan not just Thomas playing is, with? Is 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 limpid in that in that way? Robert Frost, of course, is an immensely complicated poet. I mean, you can read Stopping by Snowy Woods as if you were just reading, you know, shopping list or something. Yeah, you know? yeah. But but there are other, I mean, there are, there, there, you know, the music in that. Mm. Uh, the only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy down flake. Down the flake, yes, yeah. I know, wonderful. Um, I was going to say that I was teaching this course on songwriting lyrics, uh, which I'm not colossally qualified to do, but I've done a bit of it and they got broadcast so that's okay and I was talking about the difference between lyric and poetry and I said but what I can tell you about the similarity between lyric and poetry is where the impulse comes from and the fact that when Paul McCartney was writing yesterday 
he had the music before he had the yeah, scrambled eggs. The lyrics, scrambled eggs. Mm. Um, exactly, scrambled eggs. No, what is it? Scrambled eggs. Oh, my oh, baby, how I love your legs. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. And that is true of poetry too. That you can sometimes hear the pulse, yeah. you know, before the words follow. You just get this little whiff of something. You just yeah. get this very, very welcome smell of burning, which is yeah. you know the beginning of. A poem. So if somebody said, what did you mean by that? You know, the answer is probably, I didn't know when I started and I'm not sure now, but yeah. here it is. Anyway. Um, How do because, you know to stop? Oh, there are whole books written about ending poems. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've got a new book coming in January. It's called Loss. It consists of 20 sections and each section is an unrhymed sonnet followed by some very short lines of kind of slightly jazzy, syncopated, jagged, barbed wire kind of verse. And then the whole thing finishes with a rhymed quatrain. And I realized after the, the 19th of the poems was published in the London Review of Books, I suddenly realized that the last line of the sonnet was not, should not be the last line of the sonnet. And I have rewritten it. I mean, I, I, I've changed the ending of that poem. Uh, it's locked away forever in the LRB, but, but in, in the... Uh, Different. In the book, it will be different. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, um, I want to tie, tidy up because uh, we just went down a rabbit hole there for 10 mm. 15 minutes. You were talking about uh, in school, you had a band of. You were able to. You were able to oh, find a band of followers. A band of followers. That's my we uncle. Left off. We went yes, off down we somewhere. did. We, we went down a rabbit hole. Mm. You're right. Well, I told them that my uncle was. Uh, how old was I at this stage? Under the age of 11. My uncle was a member of the Canadian Royal Mounted Police, Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And I don't know why, I think I rather like the uniform, you know, yeah. like that pointy hat and the yeah. red jacket yeah. and all the rest of it. And that uh, we were looking for, he was looking for, boy recruits to the RNCP. And I could sign them up. I was, I was, I was, I was entitled to sign them up. I was empowered so to do. You were a scout. And, and I was a scout for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. <laughs> And um, th they would get a uniform and a badge. And I became extremely popular. Um, <laughs> I, I had a little gathering. I the pirate as well. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to cut this. You're going to cut this. You're going to cut this on my patch. Yeah, you're going to cut this on my patch. Anyway, not, um, they wanted to know when this um, uniform and badge were going to be forthcoming. So I invented a date. Yeah. You know, they were being shipped over, right. needless to say, from Canada. So it was going to take some time. So I had some, I had some time to play with. I mean, that's I had weird. some. That's weird. I had some, I had some blue water, you know, <laughs> in there. It was rather like ending a relationship. You know, mm. you think, well, I can just get through Christmas. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, it's Walter Mitty-esque. Ah, so yes, it is. So anyway, the time finally came when I could hold them off no longer. So my parents were always out during the day. Yeah. About 15 of these kids followed me to my council house and we went into the front room, which was never occupied yeah, except yeah. at Christmas. And there was a big blanket box in the front room. And I said that the uniforms and the badges were in there. I threw open the lid of the blanket box to reveal that it was empty. And I said, oh, they've been stolen. Now, of the 15 that were following me, I only lost about eight. The others believed it. We then went in search of the thieves who were... <laughs> Obviously, running around mid Buckinghamshire somewhere, yes, yeah, dressed as mounties. Dressed as mounties, <laughs> yes. So you had this uh, novel uh, ability to to, to 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 get friends, and then you didn't like school. So then, so you, you I did the, like the other last thing we were at was your father putting you into the technical. Course. Oh yeah. So the technical school, little... which is now a very good school, mm. and you can of course go to university from that school. But at the time, it was awful beyond belief. The headmaster, who was a, an unspeakable thug, and uh, said that he didn't think French was a subject worth teaching in the school. He was just only interested in lathes and metalwork yeah, yeah. and technical drawing, which mm. was a particular torture uh, for me. There was a girl's side of the school where they did sort of shorthand and needlework, yeah. and I'd have been happy there. Yeah, yeah. You know, shorthand Tiny. and needlework. I'd, yeah. yeah, I'd have loved that, yeah. especially the needlework bit. I like that. <laughs> but that was not to be the case. And he was a dreadful 
headmaster and he was known to be I mean after I left school and started doing a bit of work for the Labour Party in my days as a member of Young Socialists I said you, you do realise that this man is completely unqualified he's yeah. a wartime appointee and they said we can't get rid of him you know there's no way of getting rid of him unless he does something unspeakable so he could never keep teachers because this, he ran a school that was just appalling educationally yeah. appalling the only constant throughout that my time there was the vice head, who was a nice guy, Wallace, his name was Mr. Wallace, and, and he liked English and he liked poetry and he liked theatre and he liked me. But all the others were thugs and yobs and we taught by guys who taught him borstals. So they were hitting you and all those. Oh, yeah. God, yeah, I, yeah. I saw things done in that school yeah, to children that would have, they were under prison. Yeah. I mean, I saw a and teacher. by members of the clergy. Of course. Well, yes. Um, As was told to me by Tom Keneally. Oh, yeah. Tom Keneally said, yeah, by by the Christian brothers. I mean, yeah. I was flying back from New York once, and there was a... uh, I had the um, Wall Street Journal in my my paw, and there was a... There was, you know, they had these corrections and clarifications, little small things where they fucked up. And it was like a little thing at the bottom which said, a recent article into paedophilia in the priesthood in Ireland mistakenly said hundreds of thousands of children had been affected. Uh, We meant to have said tens of thousands. Of <laughs> in a population of three million, yeah, right, exactly, or four yeah, million yeah, at the time. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, uh, yeah, outrageous. I mean, just yeah. stuff. I mean, again, back to our comment about man killing man and war. Yes. Uh, you know, the, 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 the I don't know. How, I mean, I saw a kid slapped to the floor. Yeah. He was sitting in his desk. He laughed at something the teacher had said, or he laughed at something the boy sitting next to him had said, yeah. and the teacher took it as an insult slapped him to the floor and then picked his desk up and threw it on top of him. Yeah. I mean, dear God. I I, I'm, I'm tempted to say, and this is within living memory. You know, yeah, yeah, no. um, uh, I, I, I'm, appalling yeah, place. I know, growing up in the 70s. But, but also, also the ten- idea of when you, see, when, you, when you are 12, you know, or 13, you think you're, because there's younger boys and you think you're kind of old and mature, but when you're 50 or 60 or whatever and you look at a 12-year-old yeah. and you imagine yourself Beating, and who's not even, you know, not that it should matter, but you know, who, you know, a little 12 year old kid who thinks he's kind of grown up because he's now in secondary school, but he's a little baby, and you're going to put a fist into his head or throw a desk at him or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you just some sort of I know. mental deficiency inside yeah. someone to do that. You well, know? there was, there was, there was a, still a wartime, I think, uh, feeling of a, a need for control. And I guess that, you know, the kids in that school, myself included, were being treated as the enemy. They yeah. were. And yet, so, and yet, if you think about it in hindsight, you were the, you were the hope of the nation. And so badly gotten by, by yeah. the loss of, yeah. loss of a huge generation of... And, and it was a selective secondary school. I mean, yeah. it was like, it was, the, it was the technical equivalent of a grammar school. It yeah. was, it was, so did you get out of that? How did you get out of that? I left. Well, I mean, I, I, it, my education came to an end, age 16, and I went to work in a bookshop. My father said, I'm going on holiday, get a job by the time I get back. Fairly forthright about these things. But I understand perfectly well that they needed another income in the house. Yeah, yeah. You know, it made a big difference. Um, my mother had to work. My father yeah. had, they both had to work. He came back from work. She went out to work in the evenings. I went to the um, Youth Employment Exchange with a friend of mine, Victor Thorne, now dead, sadly. And um, we were leafing through the card index thing. And he said, oh, you like reading. There's a job at a bookshop up the road. I was going to say, it sounds like a positive busman's holiday for you. <laughs> well. Go in here and know all, all the books. But it was just being a shop assistant. So yeah, okay. I was shoveling books into bags and taking the money for them. Right. They could have been yeah. lamb shops, yeah, you know okay. what I mean? Yeah. Um, but the difference was, the colossal difference was, that working in that shop was a, an old guy, Henri de Beaufort Saunders, we had a library contract and he serviced the library books. He put the covers on and yeah. stuck in the st- yeah. date stamp things and so forth, invoiced them and so on. That was his job. He came from a rather good half French family and he liked poetry enormously. And he'd spent a lot of time making some literal, but actually rather good organized to what, the originals were, um, of Baudelaire, and in particular Les Fleurs de Mal. And um, uh, we, had a li- we had a school's book contract, so they had to be delivered. He couldn't lift boxes, but I could. He could drive and I couldn't. So we became a team, delivery team. We'd talk in the car. 
And on one occasion, he said to me, do you like poetry at all? Now, I never owned up to liking poetry because it'd get you beaten up on the estate yeah, yeah. I lived on. Yeah. And I, I said something about, well, I, I sort of, you know, I, I somehow got through Hiawatha at school, you know, and some <laughs> dismissive remark of that sort and said no more. And the next day, I said to him, I don't know why I said that to you, because I, I do like poetry. I read a lot of poetry. And, and he then started to educate me. He started to say, why don't you read this? Why don't you read that? Why don't you read the other? And not just in poetry and other things, too. So he sent me around the corner to the library at one point. He said, you must read a book called The Outsider. So I went and I asked the librarian for a book called The Outsider. And she gave me La Tranger by Camus. Um, so I came back and he said, oh, yes, a wonderful book. You must read that. But I meant Colin Wilson's book, The Outsider, which was, you know, about the outsider in literature, uh, the rebel in literature. Do you feel so, you're a rebel? Oh, sort of in one Is sense, all, in one sense, all my life. But yes, no, sort of not pretentious. I mean, I just, I mean, I don't play by the rules, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. play by the rules because I'm governed by the rules. Yeah. You know, I mean, you I know, wanted I'm, to ask about that. Because... I'm part of a, a, a country that's about to leave the European Union for reasons that only have to do with colossal financial advantage for a very small group of very ruthless people and xenophobes and racists. Cretins. Anyway. The Irish, I mean, from an Irish perspective, we're just... Oh, scratching cool. our head going, what is going on? Well, we live under the yoke of Britain for so long. We, even when I was growing up, the politicians, you know, the, the, the Margaret Thatcher Tory party of weird sexual mm. fetish combined with viciousness and, and Tebbit and, and mm. the mom and all these people. And we have bacon faced, a failed businessman in charge of the Irish. And today, our politicians are better than Britain's, I think, mm. pound for pound. I'm just looking at what is going on. I know. Well, I mean, decent civilized European countries, like the Scandinavian countries, yeah. which are Norway, Denmark, yeah. Sweden, you know, are looking at us in, in stark horror. It's not just puzzlement, know. you know. I think the French are looking at us in puzzlement. And, and what the attitude of the Germans is, I mean, sort of shock, I expect. Like, you see the leadership as well in America, that, you know, you, we, we always would look, at, look to America as. You know, the young country that can guide us to liberty and, mm. you know they're taking on the French basis for how to live humanely and humanly and that's imploding like oh a, 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 a I was reminded out. the other day of, of, of a remark that Martin Amos made many years ago when Regan was uh, president and he, he wrote a book called Einstein's Monsters didn't, yeah. didn't Martin Amos and, and he said you know here we are in the middle of this terrifying sort of standoff and so on and so forth and, and we look to the leader of the free world mm. for help and we discover him to be an old actor well by the same token you know given the shit that the world's in and given the fact that we're staring the heat death of the planet in the face yeah. uh, you know we look to the leader of the free world and we discover him to be a, a crook a, you know a serial liar a self-confessed Sorry, sexual predator yeah, yeah. yeah I mean my god you know a fantasist a, a man that makes capitalism look like piggy bank savings so you think get out of this home i don't see a way out no. i mean i'm so proud of these kids who are coming out my daughter my younger daughter hannah and her partner are beggaring themselves to make a a film about climate change and they're pretty much at the editing stage now yeah. It's principally to do with the fact that cattle farming is a major, major problem. And if you, we all became vegan tomorrow, the problem yeah. would be ameliorated but not solved. It doesn't play well in Ireland at the moment, but yeah, we have to face no, that. No, well, you know, there are cattle farmers who are innocent people raising cattle. But True. the fact yeah. of the matter is... The, but no, I, I, and, and I'm you know, so proud of the school kids who are just saying enough and no more. You know, we'd, we'd, we'd take to the streets. If, well, that's, that's my hope. hope. I, mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think that this, let's call them the, the iPhone generation who are now probably in their you know, 19 to 30, but the, 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 you know, that, that, that Swedish girl, or she Danish? Greta. Yeah. yeah she's like, and she's leading this walkouts and school. You know, so, so, and there's a lot more tolerance to sexuality and there's not, there's not bullying and there's, not, mm. there's, a, there's a lot more tolerance to race and there's a lot more tolerance mm. to if you want to be an elf, you can be an elf and we're not going to mm. get up and bully you mm. about that. So that that's the little seed of, of ah maybe those people will because we've kind of fucked it up. Oh totally. And, but we uh, haven't fucked it up. I mean, it's rather like somebody once said of the First World War. I've forgotten who it was now, but it was a it was a, it was a startling and wise comment. He said the young men of Europe were dragged out into the middle of a muddy field and told to kill each other, and yeah. so they had to. 
And I mean, you know, I've been, I'm sure you've been standing in opposition, uh, you know, since I was old enough to think yeah. um, of the gruesomeness of, of the war, of the camps, of yeah. intolerance, of racial hatred and so on and so forth. But, but unless you go into politics and are able to make a difference, and the difference seems to look like revolution. Yeah. I mean, it seems to look Pitch like that. Dawn, yeah. Yeah. Um, climate scientists say you've got a decade. Yeah. I know it's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, cars yeah. aren't going to stop running. Yeah. Cattle aren't going to stop being farmed. Well, there was a great Onion headline which said apparently a global warming issue from 2006 was still an issue. Yes. <laughs> you know, the way things come and go and the, the news cycle, and now it's back... And I, uh, I despair. I'm actually, for the first time in my life, I was saying to, to my partner that it's the first time in my life that I'm kind of, you know, I don't really mind if I don't get to see the future. I mean, I do. I'm not going to do anything like check out. But like all my life, I was going, things are getting better. Look at what's happening. And look where we could be going. Look at the yes, technology. Yes. And now I'm kind of going, oh, my God, I don't like this. So many weird, bad, only in the last 10 years. And also the phone thing where I was talking the other day about the, the evolutionary impact that's going to have on if you think about our focus yes, yes. Of, of this versus I'm sure you're normally right. we, our eyes will start going and we, you know, <clears> so, yeah anyway. no I'm sure I want to try right. and get through your yeah, career because sure. we're, we're still only in the in the, in the <laughs> 60s your first collection that was published was a violent country is that mm. right you won an award before that or for that no for that for that okay. yeah the Eric yeah. Gregory Young Poets Award oh that was before you're quite yeah. right yeah it was yeah the Eric Gregory Award was for a manuscript mm. an unpublished manuscript yeah and then a violent country on Arts Council Poetry Bursary which right. was a bit like getting best first collection or something and that was more money than I'd ever seen in one place in my life before but I don't think it was a lot of money it was like grand or something yeah you know? Um, I was just trying to work out when you realised. Did you have like? Cause you 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 even now even I think on this already you've mentioned that all poets need day jobs. Mm. When did you go? I'm going to go for this. And I'm going to make it work. And I'm going to get money. And I'm going to get paid for it. Or did you? Um, no, there wasn't a moment of decision. I mean, it was cumulative, really. I think. I mean, I just. This is business about people saying I am a poet, and other people who think that's slightly pompous who will say, "Don't you mean you write poetry?" Well, there's a point at which you've written enough poetry and taken yourself sufficiently seriously. It would be right to describe you or to be described as a poet. And I just got overtaken by it, you know, when I first read those border ballads and felt myself melting inside. I mean, I, I just knew I was in the presence of something that I couldn't do anything about. And, um, so young as well. Yeah. Lucky. I, mean, I never, I, I just... I want to be a footballer. You, know, you soon realise you're not good enough to do that in your dream. Yeah, Simon Harson wanted to be a footballer yeah. at that stage. I once said to Simon, I said, was I an atrocious father or was I an appalling father? I don't know. I said, I, did I ignore you as a child? Because, you, you know, he sat in my study when he, I was I, writing. That's a very evocative part yeah. of my interview yeah. with him where he used to have to sit in silence, but you always seemed to be supplying him with colouring books or picture books which the way he remembers that as being he was happy just to be in your company yeah yeah um and i know you not to disturb you when you were writing i yes he did <laughs> yeah. i think i i think i was a bit neglectful frankly and i, I said to him i seem to remember i bought you a, a goal post that we put in the garden and you'd be in goal and i'd be taking the the penalties and he said Yes, that is true. You would do that. And you were always reading a fucking book. At the same time. <laughs> At the same time. <laughs> Imagine the sort of footballer you would have been. And up comes David with a slot home, the winning... Pro He's reading a book by Camus. <laughs> so then, so then the, you know... Should be reading my left foot, wouldn't I? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so then we, we had the 60s. So you're writing, you know, your, 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 your career is starting to take off. The prolific nature of... Of you is another thing I wanted to get. How do you be how, like? I know it's a stupid question, but is it was there ever a time when you went, I can kick back, I can relax? Uh, no, I I just had to do other things to make a to make a living. So I worked in this bookshop for ten years. I got married uh, when I was nineteen, which was a typical piece of working class folly. Uh, and I don't mean in saying that to. To in any way that doesn't reflect on my former wife or anything of that mm. kind. It was just it was it's what too young. 
it just happened, you know, it just happened. And, and, and it was okay. I mean, it was, you yeah. know, except the, the, the non-okay thing about it was that I was that young yeah. and I was having children and yeah. I, I was broke, you know, yeah. I mean, permanently broke. I've been yeah. broke all my life, you know. I n- I've never stopped worrying about money in my entire life. I've never stopped worrying about money. You talked about the mysteries of domesticity. Oh, yes. What does that mean? Well, I wrote a, a sequence of poems called Marriage. In fact, the book that they were published in was called Marriage. And it was about the relationship, well, it was obliquely about the relationship between Pierre Bonnard and Martin Meligny, who I'm sure you know was his lifelong companion and model and eventually wife after they've been together for 30 years. And there's a story about that. And it occurred to me in reading what I'd written, (laughs) really, that in any long-term relationship that's in any way beneficial to both parties, in other words, if it's not conflict, there is something going on under the surface all the time. There's a sense in which dinner is only dinner. Um, You just put it on the table and you eat it. But there's another sense in which all food is a sacrament. And those two things run in parallel, and one is much deeper than the other. Mm -hmm. And that applies, I think, not just to food being a sacrament, but also, you know, in all sorts of other things. I mean, if you think about it, and I think about it all the time, a gesture, you know, that you make can be a perfectly ordinary indicative gesture, but also there's something about the gesture that has to do with the way that hands make patterns and words. I mean, words matter. You can mm. say something to somebody that wounds them deeply mm. and and you can never say, I didn't mean that because you did mean that. Yes. Those are the words you chose yeah. or those are the words that came to you to use. So the mysteries of domesticity are those gestures, that meal, the ritual, those the words ritual. and the ritual. Yeah, the ritual and, and the, the ritual yeah. that lies on top of everything that just isn't apparent or well it is apparent but it's not seen um it's there but it's not seen it's it's visible invisible are you religious no i was brought up a baptist that's a hell of an introduction to religion i can tell you i'm very interested in in christology christology Uh, being studies of the gospel yeah I, i wrote this piece called the judas passion around last year it was performed here and in the states a composer called sally beamish i've worked mostly with harrison burt whistle but i work with other composers too. so that david is referring to his he's a libertist which is somebody who writes words for operas and he's worked with uh, burt whistle and this one here so that's sally beamish uh, and and um Hugh well. watkins and jonathan dove mm-hmm. and i'm shortly i hope going to be working with roxana panufnik on an intriguing little piece about um a murder victim called rose Harson. Oh, yeah. No relation. Not sure. Mm. Probably. Okay. Probably. Um, so I'm. I'm. Yes, I'm very interested in religion without being religious. I'm interested in doctrine. I'm interested in religious argument. I'm very interested in uh, religious writings. I'm. In, I'm very interested in in liberal Judaism, which I think is fascinating for its lack of a hell and lack of a devil. Its community aspect is so powerful uh, and so embracing in a way that Christian communities are not, it seems to me, in my experience anyway. Yeah, I'm I'm interested in the Gospels and I'm interested in the contradictory aspect of the Gospels. I I, I listen to Bart Ehrman, you know, who's a very famous Gospel writer, studier, and he studied it historically, and he said you need to... You need to read the Gospels uh, instead of linearly. You need to read them horizontally and see the sheer amount of bullshit. Mm. You know, mm. <laughs> like Jesus actually doesn't say he's God until the Gospel of John, which is the last Gospel, yeah. and it's something yeah. like 120. He doesn't say much on his way to Golgotha until the Gospel of John, where he's chatty Cathy and he's talking yeah. to everybody. Yeah. You know, and yet when I look at my my indoctrination as a child, this lying to children element of Catholicism and of many other religions, I go, if I had the access to this stuff when I was 12 or 13, I would just be, bang, this is ridiculous. Yes. But we they're handpicking bits and pieces from all over that says, yeah, th- this is the way to, yes. to be. And, and yet I have friends who are my age who are very intelligent who go, and, and the worst thing I hate is 
yes, but in order to be uh, to have you know faith requires having faith. And I go, well, so does Santa Claus, you know what I mean? And so does the Easter Bunny. But, you know, the, the defences that are put up. Yeah. And, the, and, you know, your man's very arrogant as an atheist. And I said, well, you don't bring a knife to a gunfight, you know? Uh, the most yeah. arrogant, one-dimensional thing is the dogma and the preaching. of. Mm. Now, you've always been talked to, I know that, as if you're a man, you know, with a fork in a world of soup. Yeah, I mean, you, you yeah. cut. But the reason that Judas, the Judas piece fascinated me yeah. was that if you write the Easter story with Judas as the central figure rather than Christ as the central figure, a lot of things turn around. I mean, it, it was fascinating to me, for example, and, I'm, and I read a lot of theology on this, and I know what the differences of opinion are uh, about the fact that Judas is one of the unsavable. So during the harrowing of hell, which I know is not doctrinal, but, but it's in the creed, so we can, yeah. you know, we can... Christ brings out the souls of the unborn children and the, and the uh, virtuous pagans. Um, but the three, I think, that are left in hell are Judas... Herod Lucifer, and Cain. Cain. And, the first um, big sinner. Yeah. Um, but why Judas? Because Judas died before the salvific moment. He died before Christ died on the cross. Um, he hanged himself. He hanged himself. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are two versions, but yeah, we'll yeah. take yeah, hanged yeah, himself. Yeah. <laughs> His reasons for doing so, in my version, are to do with the fact that he believed that he was chosen for his role, mm -hmm. and there's there's definite doctrinal evidence, to, to, you know, gospel evidence, mm -hmm. to suggest that. So that for the moment when, when Judas went out, who, who is that? Which of the gospel? Judas went out and it was dark, and, uh, and it was night, whichever it is. That, that at the moment that Judas left the cenacle, left the upstairs room where the Last Supper was taking place, there is, of course, an argument in theology about whether he had taken the Eucharist in, in effect and so right. he should be saved uh, yeah, but, yeah. but he goes out and nobody quite knows why he's going out except perhaps Jesus yeah. knows why he's going out because you said what you have to do go and go now and do quickly but the other disciples it, it, it's possible thought he was going out for a bit more unleavened bread because yeah. of course he was the bag man Judas carried the money well, even the determinism, is, is it, is the determinism it in, of him doing that, he should be saved because he, without him, none of the... Exactly. You know, it's exactly. All, it's all but but at the point at which he leaves and goes out to do that, mm -hmm. that's at the point at which, for my money, Christendom starts that, right. at, that, at that point. Mm -hmm. If he had hanged himself presumably after the, uh, after the salvific moment, then yeah. there would have been a different outcome for him. So that's fascinating. And also the fact that the, the betrayal, for example... Uh, which the King James Version always renders uh, the word betrayal as the translation from the Koine Greek uh, paradidomai. Well, paradidomai does not mean betray. It means hand over. So in handing over Christ to the uh, Sanhedrin, Judas thinks that what he's doing is giving Christ the opportunity because yeah. it's well past time yeah. that Christ said this, you know, when uh, Caiaphas says, you know, are you the son of God? Christ says, well, I am actually, and watch this, you know. <laughs> well, also, uh, but that's not that, what happened. There was an, an, another theory that G Judas was just going, this guy's saying he's the king of the Jews. He's got to, at some point, pull out his sword and make all this, you know, all this yeah. war or glorification happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that he was trying to speed things up a little bit. Well, that's that's the that's you know, the uh, was Christ a terrorist um, theory? You know, well, because nobody knows what the word Iscariot means. That's in Judas Iscariot, the name. Uh, there are theories that it's where he came from. There's no proof of that. So, but one of the theories is that it comes from the word Sicari, which is the group of men who used to carry a small knife under their cloaks. Hence the term cloak and dagger, uh -huh. um, and stab any kind of Roman they happen to come across. Um, <laughs> uh, the Sicari. How do you feel about your legacy? I don't know. I mean, who? it's impossible for any writer to know whether you'll continue to be read. In a world where reading is normal, I suppose you might think that your work might be being read in a couple of hundred years' time, uh, if you're any good. You, you, you're not certain of being read for as long as Wordsworth or Keats. Yeah. You can't possibly think you might be read for as long as Dante or Homer. But uh, at the same time, you might think, well, I've got a bit of a stretch, probably. I think I've I've knocked, knocked, I think I've knocked off a few good things. <laughs> yes, I <laughs> uh, <laughs> But we don't live in a world where people read much. No, no. Um, one of the reasons that publishing has become a tricky business is that publishers have their backs to the wall mm. because of colossal outfits like Amazon yeah, um, and Google. 
I know mean, you just mentioned to me that your audio book has, has, has come out and I'm, I'm happy to download that but that, that, that's another way of, of looking at it because people are have uh, instead of listening to radio they're listening to podcasts like this or they're listening to audio books and stuff so there may be I think, and also the fact that the e-reader has kind of died and well, not died, but it's, it, it hasn't taken off to the same extent. Book sales no. are actually up the last couple of years. Yeah. Last question: What would you say to like your younger self, or even a young person who felt that at twelve, thirteen, that they wanted to be a poet? Would you say don't? <laughs> no, I'd never say don't. What would your advice? It, it's got my wife's an actress. You probably know, and uh, there's a the thing actors all seem to say. You know, I would discourage my child any child from, from becoming an actor. And I would say, well, why? Yeah. If it's in their blood, yeah. if they've got a hunger for it, why on earth would you try and talk them out of something? Very few people in this world have a hunger for anything uh, virtuous, anything yeah. like writing, painting, acting, you know, the arts and, and so on. So why on earth would you want to talk somebody out of that? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, because you sit around waiting for the phone to ring. Who cares? Exactly. You know, be energetic about it. Do something. If you love it, do it. So I would say, no, I would never, ever try and discourage. I mean, I was delighted when Simon, he, when he was a kid, painted. And then came to me one day, God love him, and said, I'm going to give up painting. And I said, oh, no, gosh, my son, the painter. That's, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> where's that going to go? Yeah. And he said, but I'd really like to have a go at photography. Yeah. Fine. And I said, why are you giving up painting? And he said, how old was he? 13, maybe? He said, I'm good at it, but I'll never be great at it. Yeah. Which is very... Ah, I mean, you know, that... When, when I think back to that moment, mm -hmm. I think, Jesus Christ. It's tough for kids. Yeah. yeah. But well, he, he knew, football. and he was right, what's yeah, more. Yeah. So I and bought him a camera. No one's ever <laughs> getting to see his I got sod all money, and I went out and bought him the cheapest yeah. Russian camera you can buy, because it's all I got the money. In fact, I think I stole the money, now I come to think of it. Um, well, I might steal the money, but I nicked a few books from where I was working and sold them. But that was a line set, in his set. sand. You, know, you doing that is what set him off on this. Yeah. Day, you know? And driving, no, I, him, I, driving I would, him down to, where was it, Watford for... That was another extraordinary... Shall I tell this story yeah, about sure. Simon? Um, it was um, Amersham College, and he applied and they said, we're full. Then we got a letter saying, well, we've had a couple of cancellations, so if you'd like to come along, you yeah. know, and could you bring your portfolio, if you have one, mm -hmm. uh, and could you bring a piece of written work? Now, written work with Simon, you know, is a tricky business. Yeah. So we got there, and I, it was apparent that there were lots of kids who were going to be applying for these two places I think they had. And we were quite early in that process, and I knew there were a lot of people to see behind us. At least I assumed there were, and I think that's true. So Simon showed the guy his portfolio, and he went through it without speaking. These were just photographs that Simon had taken, yeah. you know. Around the neighborhood. Yeah, maybe. around the neighborhood yeah. and that kind of stuff, but interesting stuff. And he was developing his own stuff. Mm -hmm. At this point, he was doing his own developing in his bedroom. He was developing color, for mm -hmm. heaven's sake, you know. And the guy looked at the portfolio, and then he said, okay, you're supposed to bring a piece of written work? So Simon reaches into his hip pocket and takes out this piece of lined notepaper, which has been folded into four, and the ink has soaked Brilliant. through, you know. Yeah. And the guy picked up, so opened it, <laughs> opened it up, as you might sort of oh. open a you know, I don't know, a sticky toffee paper or yeah, something, yeah, yeah. you know. And he sort of just gave it a couple of seconds and then dropped it in the bin, you know. And he said, you've got the place. Brilliant. He was, he, so he, he we were walking way. away and I said to Simon, you know where the car is, don't you know where the car park is? He said, yeah. I went back and I said to the guy, you must have a lot of people after this and you saw his piece of written work and so on. Why are you giving him the place? I mean, I'm delighted that you are. Of course mm. I am, but I'm just curious to know. And he said, I've got kids that have been here two years that can't do what he's doing. Thank God, because there's also the jobs worthy who goes, yeah, your you're photographs are great, but your piece of writing yeah, wasn't, yeah, you know, to your yeah. point earlier, but I never managed to use whatever technical degree that you got when you were 15. I think I would say to somebody, I would never discourage somebody who wanted to write. I might give them notes. I think I would say, don't expect anyone ever to want it, yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. Don't think that when you offer it to the world, the grateful answer will be, thank you very much for your work of genius. It might well be, who are you? And you have to be, you have to work against that. Mm -hmm. And I think it, somebody once said to my wife, how did David get where he is from where he started? And she said, anger. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the real answer was energy, was refusal to, to give up. I mean, people think I just sent poems to 
lots of places and they published them and then OUP <laughs> did my book and so forth. I spent 10 years, 10 years in the wilderness, sending poems out to this magazine, getting them back, sending the ones I got back from magazine B to magazine A, the ones I got back from magazine A to magazine C and so yeah. on and so on and so on. Until finally I started getting published. And I think I started getting published at the point at which I was starting properly to write. I was, you know, I was glad for that, um, for those gatekeepers, I was glad yeah. of that. They weren't letting me to publish to it. And so many people t these days are publishing too early because they can. Keep publishing yourself. Thanks for, uh, uh, I don't mean self-publishing, keep getting stuff <laughs> published. And thank you for taking the time out. I really enjoyed that conversation. And uh, anything else you want to add before you go? No, I don't think so, Sean, except it was a pleasure. I can finish with a poem if you want to. Let's do that. Can we do that? Anyway, it was a great pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So, okay, so this is another poem from Salt. The last poem in the book, the longest poem in the book, but it's only a sonnet, so don't panic. Um, here we go. Waking at the dead hour, blinds open to moonlight, your silhouette sharp cut on a wall, white as bone, as salt. Both this and a vision of this, one set down on the other, the moon itself and a version of itself, the room a place you might come to or soon abandon. And it rises now, a pain behind your eyes, touching the sclera, touching the nerve, rag ends of a dream where you find your lover in her husband's bed. See it out, see it out, each breath a dead weight, each passing thought masquerading as your last, all night wide-eyed in that backwash of white-blue light, so your pulse goes with the tides and her blood too. When the ache in a turning wave is a vacancy in air, as if music might break the silence, or silence be endless. Thank you, sir.